Okay, so recording. Uh, so thank you uh, all for being here. I appreciate your attendance and interest in the systematic review uh, seminar series. This is the first session in the series, which is types of reviews. On this slide, you can see a rundown of what the future sessions will be. And it roughly goes according to, you know, chronologically as, you know, as if you were doing a systematic review. So I go through the steps sort of piece by piece as it goes along. Um, starting with this session, just discussing reviews generally, and then looking at uh, PRISMA and some of the systematic review guidelines, and then looking at how to create um, a systematic review, starting with a question, developing a search strategy, using software to help, and then getting into the screening, data extraction, and all of that stuff. So that'll be for much later on in the series. Um, all of these, if you're interested in attending, all of these sessions are listed on the Himmelfarb website. So if you go to himmelfarb.gwu.edu and go to the bottom, you'll see a list of our upcoming classes. So you'll see all these sessions listed there and it's also where you can register. And so when you register, I will reach out in the day or days beforehand and send out the link and all that sort of thing. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into this topic, which is types of reviews. So I'm gonna begin by talking about broad categories of literature reviews, and then specifically looking at systematic reviews versus like classical reviews or narrative reviews, whatever terminology someone might use for those, then delve into <clears throat> types of systematic reviews. Before I do that though, I wanna get a sense of why people are interested in this session or this series. Um, so if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat your answer to this. So why are you interested in, in this series? Let me open up the chat window uh, for that. And so what is it that, that brings you to this? So are you contemplating a systematic review? Are you definitely doing a systematic review? Do you just wanna know more about the process? Um, if you don't mind putting in the chat, uh, kind of where where you are on this. Uh, so let me, I see an answer there. Let me, oops. Going to do a systematic review for your CE. Yep. Uh, yep, new doctoral system, uh, student, systematic review due soon. So that's a good reason. Um, okay, so it sounds like people will definitely have these types of projects on the horizon. Um, sorry, let me getting all sorts of messages here. Um, uh, okay, so thank you for that. That helps me to understand a little bit. Um, so the reason for talking about categories of literature reviews is really about having shared expectations. And this is, I do lots and lots of consultations with students and faculty um, from School of Nursing, Public Health, Medicine, uh, all the related uh, departments that we serve on performing systematic reviews. And what I find very often is that people use the language in different ways. You know, there may be a term that if you say literature review or you know, uh, narrative review or systematic review, it means a certain thing to me, but it may not mean the same thing to the person I'm talking with. And so that's one of the first things that I like to discuss is what do we mean when we say these terms? So if you ask for help with the systematic review, what are the parameters of that project? Because when you say it to me, it means a certain thing, but it may not mean the same thing to you. Um, and so that's why I wanna talk about this a little bit. Uh, because I think it's very important to have a shared set of expectations. Um, so the way I break it down uh, is there are kind of the broad world of literature reviews, and I break that down into kind of two main categories, the classical or narrative reviews and then systematic reviews. So the classical or narrative review is what 
these have been published for a long time. This is, you know, an expert reads a number of articles on a topic, summarizes their meaning and writes a review article. Um, as opposed to a systematic review, which is one that is usually a team of people and they have a very systematic methodology that they use to perform the review. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about, um, why, uh, why that's, um, you know, what the important difference is. And really, I think systematic reviews are kind of, uh, exist because of some of the limitations of classical review articles. And I'm not uh, trying to denigrate or say that classical review articles or narrative reviews are, aren't any good. They perfectly good articles that can be a great introduction to a particular topic. Someone uh, who is an expert in a particular field um, may, um, you know, will go through the articles and then summarize those that can be very helpful. But a systematic review means a very specific thing. And so there are categories of systematic reviews. There's the kind of classical systematic review. Um, people do rapid reviews because systematic reviews are very time consuming and maybe you want to get information out quicker. So there's ways of limiting the process of a systematic review to a rapid review. Uh, there's meta analyses, which is doing a systematic review and then layering on top of that really rigorous statistical analysis of the data, um, you know, actually combining data from different studies. You know, this is the work of a statistician really and scoping reviews. So doing a systematic review methodology, but, um, uh, but having a very different outcome, you know, a systematic review is about answering a question. Typically, you know, there's two drugs for treating this condition, which one is better? That's the type of question you're answering with a systematic review classically. A scoping review isn't about answering a question, it's about describing the literature. So I'm gonna look at all the literature that exists on a particular topic, and I'm gonna determine where the gaps are in that literature. And those gaps will suggest future research, uh, you know, a future research agenda for myself or others. Um, so there's different things you can do with the systematic review methodology. Um, but again, the reason why I think this is important is people throw around these terms and they may mean different things, literature review, class, systematic review, narrative review, and it's really important to nail down what do people mean? What are, what is their, what are their expectations? So here's a chart that I like to use because it compares the narrative or classical review with a systematic review. And this is from an article from 2015, um, really showing the differences. And I, I think the, the author did a nice job of highlighting the key differences here. Um, so the, for the hypothesis, clearly defined, well-formulated clinical research topic and question, um, as opposed to a classical review, which is more of a broad overview of a topic. Uh, for search methods, there's a very pre predefined, extremely protocol-based search with a systematic review that tends not to be the case with classical reviews. Um, inclusion of studies in a systematic review is based on predefined criteria um, in a systematic review as opposed to a classical review where it's more intuition and expertise that would drive an author to include or exclude a particular article. Searches are more diverse and tend to use a lot more databases for a systematic review as opposed to a narrative review, which often is a PubMed search for a health topic. Um, data extraction, again, protocol-based for a systematic review. Narrative review, it's typically a simple description of the study findings. Synthesis uh, is guided by things like Prisma guidelines that tell you the proper way to synthesize the data. Um, whereas for a classical review, it's often a, just a description of each study. Um, and so, so on, you can kind of see what some of the other ones are, but you can see kind of the key differences between the two. And again, I'm not saying that 
a systematic review is the only type of review you should write. There's definitely a place for narrative or classical reviews. Um, they're just different types of projects. And I, I think the systematic review has really risen in prominence in the last five, 10 years because it's seen as a way of addressing some of the shortcomings of classical reviews. And the big thing there is if you think about the process of performing a classical review, there's a lot of possibility for the introduction of bias. Um, in that it's often a single author choosing which articles they want to look at, you know, without a defined process for how they go about including or excluding. So they're just choosing the ones that they think are the most important and they're sort of extracting the key points as they see them. So there's a great possibility of bias being introduced in that, um, you know, an author, maybe they would highlight their own work or maybe they would ignore the work of someone they didn't like, um, or maybe they would sort of cherry pick the findings out of the articles. There's not to say that that is a necessary result of a classical review, but it's a possibility. And it's a possibility that is less likely in a systematic review because there's the methodologies involved, uh, the, the methodologies involved with it are largely geared towards uh, minimizing the possibility of such biases. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense in terms of why these two things are different. And in, in my mind, the systematic review is really an answer to the shortcomings of the classical review. Um, uh, so hopefully that helps in kind of defining that a little bit. Um, so when we say systematic, what is it that makes it systematic? And I've talked about a little, uh, talked a little bit about this in the prior slide, but here are some of the things in my mind that really make, really differentiate a systematic review from a classical review. Uh, methodologically rigorous. So there is a method section in a systematic review in which you say, we looked at these databases, we use these terms, we use these limits, we searched on this date, here are the results that we got. Um, you report the methods, what you did to, to, uh, to get to the end. In a classical review, there typically is not any kind of discussion of methods. Um, you just sort of trust that the author pick the right articles to look at. And, you know, very often I'm sure they do, but uh, there's no, there isn't that methodological uh, rigor there, which feeds into the second point of well-documented. You really need to take good notes when performing a systematic review. What databases you search, what terms you use, what date you did the search on, what limits you used, how many articles came out of that. When you combine the results, how many duplicate articles did you find? Um, really need good documentation. And so when I work with people on long-term projects, we share spreadsheets via Google Drive where we you know, keep really good notes because these projects take a long time uh, for a full systematic review. It takes a long time. And so, um, you know, you're going to have to report these things later on and it may be one year or two years until you're finished for a full, you know, a large systematic review and you're not going to remember all these things. So you have to take good notes the whole time being protocol driven. So you really have to think through before you even begin, how am I going to perform this review? What are the steps that I'm going to take? Very specifically, what terms am I going to use? What databases am I going to look at? All of those sorts of things. You really need to look through that um, because, uh, you know, and that's, that's really one of the things that need to be part of it is driven by protocols. Um, trying to be exhaustive. So efforts are made to identify all relevant articles. So the search strategies that, you know, when I work with folks on systematic reviews, the search strategies that we come up with are often paragraphs of terms, you know, look for this term or this term or this term or this term. It's all the synonymous terms, all the related terms. We try to be exhaustive in the language that we use because we don't want to miss any articles. Um, 
that sort of things, you know, you just, you don't want to miss any pertinent articles. So you make an effort to be as exhaustive as possible in your search. Um, and so that takes time. It takes time to develop the searches. It's a very iterative process. You know, I've never, never just sat down and written out a search strategy and it was perfect. There's always iterations of that. You do the search, you realize there's terms you forgot. And so you feed those into the search and you rerun it, et cetera. Um, so that is, uh, you know, kind of the, how exhaustive it is and the minimization of bias. This is something I I've talked about. Um, steps are taken to cut down on the possibility of bias being introduced into the sessions and guided by accepted standards. This is something that I will, um, something that I'll talk about, uh, more in the next session is the use of, um, Prisma and other standards that exist. So systematic reviews are daunting projects. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of expectations in there, but what's great is there there's guidance out there to help you along the way. I mean, publish guidance from like the Cochrane collaboration or the Joanna Briggs Institute or the Prisma guidelines. And also there's help from librarians. There's a number of us who work at Himmelfarb who have been trained in supporting folks doing systematic reviews. Um, so there's help out there. Um, it's, it's a daunting project. And I know a lot of students get involved with these projects. A faculty member approaches them and, you know, they agree and they don't really know what they've gotten themselves into. Um, so I, I talk to a lot of students who are in, in that boat. Um, and you know, so often our discussions are just going through step by step what to expect. Um, oh, no problem. Um, so the types of systematic reviews, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but the classic systematic review, which is answering a question, scoping review, which is describing the literature. <clears throat> um, and this is oftentimes what people want, actually. They come to me and they say, I want to do a systematic review. And when they describe their project, what they're, what they really want is to describe the literature around a particular topic. They aren't trying to answer a particular question. So I'll often try to guide them towards performing a scoping review, which methodologically is very similar, but there are some key differences. You have rapid reviews, which is the abbreviated version of a systematic review or a meta-analysis I talked about. And there are qualitative systematic reviews, systematic reviews of qualitative data. Um, so it's not all numeric data. There's a lot of different types of reviews that people perform using roughly similar methodologies. Um, so I just want to take a little look at scoping reviews because I think this is something people often overlook. Um, again, describing literature versus answering a question. But what I want to show here is I did a search in Scopus for articles that contain the phrase scoping review in their titles. And the reason I did that is one of the uh, Prisma guidelines for properly reporting a systematic review or scoping review is that you clearly identify your review as a systematic review slash scoping review in the title. And so what that usually means is including the phrase in the title. So, you know, uh, the use of mobile phone apps for treating adolescent diabetes, a systematic review um, would be the type of title. So it makes it easy to find scoping reviews or systematic reviews. You just search for articles that have that phrase in the title. Anyway, so long story short, I did that with Scopus and you can see this kind of explosion over recent years of the number of published scoping reviews in Scopus. So Scopus is a large database. It's sort of like PubMed, but even bigger. Um, and you can see, I don't have the 2021 data, but you can see this, the projected growth here of these. So a couple of years ago, you know, you didn't see many scoping reviews. That wasn't a very common publication, but they're really growing in prominence because they've, they meet a very specific need, which is, I don't really want to answer a question. I want to describe the literature that exists around this topic. Um, 
And so, uh, so I just want to point that out because I think a lot of times people uh, don't really consider a scoping review. Like I want to do a systematic review, you know, as if that's the only option, but there are other options. Um, so in conclusion, uh, let's see, yeah, coming towards the end of time, there are different review types. There's the classical narrative review versus the systematic review. And then there are types within systematic reviews. Um, you know, the, what I've described systematic versus scoping. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, the next session will be in this WebEx room and it will be a Wednesday. Uh, February 17th uh, in this very same WebEx room. Again, it is listed um, on the Himmelfarb webpage. So you go to himmelfarb.gw.edu, go to the very bottom and you'll see a list of our upcoming sessions and the Prisma, Cochrane and other guidelines session is coming up in two weeks. There's also a, um, a guide for this entire project. Let me cut and paste that again into the chat because I know some folks uh, came in later. So this is a guide that is sort of the companion for this whole series. <clears throat> and as I do these sessions, I what's in the guide right now are the recordings from when I did it the last time. And as I go along, I'm going to update those recordings and slides. Uh, every time I redo one of the sessions, but this is where the materials will live when I, the recording, when it, oh, it gets transcribed and our, my slides will be in that guide. So you can definitely go back to that. Um, so anyway, I want to end there. I'm gonna stop screen sharing and well, I'll turn off the recorder. <laughs>